So welcome everyone to our second uh, book launch uh, event of, uh, of, uh, of today, of our Reading Week at SOAS. Um, today we're really delighted to have the launch event for uh, resounding uh, Taiwan, musical re reverberations across a vibrant island, uh, a book that's edited by uh, Nancy Guy and it's the 37th book in the Routledge Taiwan uh, series. We're welcoming back the uh, book's editor and chapter author, Nancy Guy, as well as uh, two of the chapter authors, Meredith Schweig and Jennifer uh, Shear. So the plan of today's session is that um, Nancy is going to speak about the origins and the overview of the uh, of the book chapter. Um, and in addition, uh, we'll have uh, three uh, chapter uh, talks. And then we should have sufficient time for lots of discussion and, uh, and Q&A. So I still remember the first time that uh, Nancy raised the idea of this uh, book on uh, Taiwanese music. I think she rightly pointed out the way that um, it seemed that um, international Taiwan studies had almost um, neglected um, um, Taiwan music. I remember, I think, um, I think you may have made a Nancy may have made a reference to the Handbook of Contemporary Taiwan, which I think didn't really cover uh, music. Um, but I thought I was really excited when I first heard this um, this idea, uh, partly because we've we've run quite a lot of events on Taiwanese music, and we've found they've been really really popular um, at at SOAS. Students have tried to uh, write on this um, uh, on this topic in their essays and in their research. So we were sure there would be a really good uh, market for uh, this. Um, I also have to commend Nancy in the way that she's managed to make this volume materialize and materialize in a really very difficult um, uh, period in, in all our lives as, as academics. Um, the, if I remember correctly, the first original workshop was due to be held, I think, in April of um, 2020, when I think I was actually due to um, be there in uh, in San Diego, but everything uh, got um, um, very messy around that kind of time. So we had to kind of switch to um, online uh, workshops. Was it one or two? I can't remember now. But I think the fact that you were able to basically turn around this this project um, from the the spring of 2020 to actually have the book published in the summer of 2021 is a real achievement. I think that. Um, uh, usually, at least in my experience, edited volumes, if they're going well, take three or four uh, years. So uh, it really shows um, uh, Nancy's skills at this difficult um, uh, task of edited uh, volumes. Um, let me just say a few words about our wonderful uh, panel that we're really kind of delighted to have uh, here. So first of all, we have the, the book's editor and chapter author, uh, professor uh, Nancy Guy, uh, who's a professor of music at the University of California uh, at uh, San Diego. She's someone very familiar to us at uh, SOAS. Uh, I think she's been here at least uh, three times. Um, she was here twice in 2016 um, when she spoke about her uh, wonderful book, um, Peking uh, Opera and Politics in, uh, in Taiwan. Um, and she also joined us in the summer of 2016 for our our summer school, which was one of the two, well, one of maybe two of the best summer schools that we've had um, uh, at at SOAS. And we had a very very heavy focus on Taiwanese music in 2016 as well as 2017. But she also came back in um, in 2018 to talk about her research about uh, the, the violinist uh, Li Shuta. Um, the other thing I would say that I've really enjoyed working with Nancy is in the book uh, Taiwan Studies uh, Revisited, um, which I think if you want to get a sense of, of, of Nancy's uh, research career trajectory, it's a really good uh, way to get a feel of, of the kind of the, uh, the journey from Peking Opera uh, to the uh, her next book on uh, Beverly Sills, which is a very, very different uh, book and the way that she came back into uh, Taiwan studies uh, over the last uh, five to uh, to six uh, years. So welcome back, um, uh, Nancy. 
Our second speaker, uh, Professor Meredith Schweig, is also someone familiar to SOAS uh, audiences. Uh, Meredith is um, uh, a professor in ethnomusicology at Emory University, um, and she came to SOAS a year after uh, Nancy in the summer school of 2017, which was also an amazing um, um, program with a very heavy focus on uh, on music. And um, on that occasion, Meredith spoke about her research on the rap scene in, in Taiwan, and for, so very different from her chapter in, in this book. Uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to see that uh, Meredith's book is now forthcoming on Taiwanese um, uh, rap scene. Uh, so that means that we're definitely going to bring Meredith back to speak about that, um, um, ideally in person, uh, but if not um, online. Um, and then our final, um, our third speaker is someone that I haven't met before, but I'm really delighted to, uh, to bring you into the SOAS family. And that's uh, Professor Jennifer Shear from the Department of Anthropology at the University of Michigan uh, Ann Arbor. Um, uh, she's also got a, um, a forthcoming or a book in, uh, in progress, which um, sounds like it's quite closely related to this, um, this chapter with a tentative title of From Festival uh, to Decibel, Making Noise in um, Urban Taiwan. So once you've got a sense of when that book is out, let us know and, and we'd love to, uh, uh, to host you uh, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, our audience have really, really loved uh, hearing about uh, research on, on Taiwanese music. Uh, so now then, um, let me pass on to our star editor, uh, Nancy Guy. Thanks so much for that very generous introduction, David. And thank you for you and um, Jewel and everyone at SOAS for making this event possible. And I think I did tell you once that after I finished the Sills book, you had invited me to come to SOAS and I, I was actually not sure I was going to continue on in Taiwan studies. So um, thanks to you, I'm back and happy and um, thrilled to be doing this work again. Um, and I also just want to mention, I always think David is a kind of unusual political scientist because he really seems to care a lot about music and he's um, been very supportive of it in many, many different ways in his um, position at SOAS. So um, I'm grateful to him for a lot. So thank you so much. Uh, let me share my screen. Whoops, wrong button. Um, share my screen and get started with this presentation. Um, so, one thing I just want to mention is that I'm dedicating this book to Li Shu De. Daphne had already mentioned him. Um, I was doing some research on her life and her career, and um, she really has been an important force in my life and really um, help, helping me fall in love with Taiwan when I was like 21 years old and was in Taiwan for the first time. So um, just want to shout out to, to her, now 92 years old. So um, the inspiration for this volume was sparked in the 2019, um, April 2019, at the European Association for Taiwan Studies annual meeting. Of the nearly 60 paper presentations, there were only three on music, one on theater, none on dance, and just a few on historical topics. The program included two presentations on film and seven on literature. On the whole, the arts and humanities, with the exception of literature, were sorely underrepresented. The published research of many of the contributors to this volume had already effectively demonstrated that music is a vital player in various aspects of life in Taiwan. However, until now, Taiwan studies scholars from other disciplines have been slow to take notice of this body of scholarship. One is hard pressed to find music mentioned in more than a cursory way, if at all, in recently published Taiwan studies scholarship or in landmark works. And as David mentioned, even the Rutledge Handbook of Contemporary Stu uh, Taiwan confirms the glaring absence of thinking about music. If we were to take the body of Taiwan studies scholarship as representative of Taiwan, we would conclude that the Taiwan is virtually silent, except for human 
verbal communication, of course. Unsurprisingly, Taiwan studies is not unique among area studies in its lack of attention to music and sound. Writing in 2010, ethnomusicologist Timothy Rice notes, quote, turning a blind eye or a deaf ear to music may be endemic to area and community studies, end quote. Given Taiwan's ever fascinating political environment, it's not surprising that the field of Taiwan studies has been dominated by political scientists. My own research indicates that music is vital to politics in Taiwan, not only in campaign rallies and songs, but also in protest movements and in the formation and expression of ideological and identity formations. Music can provide an efficacious tool for the mapping and assessing of deeply held sensibilities. Music represents a valuable tool in the analysis of culture and society. As political science is finally moving beyond the rational actor model, it's my hope that the political science wing of Taiwan studies, among other disciplinary groups, will more fully bring into their purview the feelings and emotions that underlie and motivate behavior. Music often provides a key tool for surveying these terrains. The contributors to this volume aim to awaken scholars to the resource that music and its scholarship offer in understanding Taiwan. <laughs> the essays gathered in this volume demonstrate some of the ways in which music and its study enrich our understanding and interpretation of the forces that, when woven together, form Taiwan. These forces include political policies, both those involved in the ne negotiation of Taiwan's place in the world and those that order Taiwan internally. And these forces include the feelingful reactions to and, asser and assertions of those policies. Many forms of human relations, down to the hierarchical structures or rhizomatic networks that organize or underlie communities are negotiated in music sound and music behaviors. This volume illustrates how music historically and currently resounds across the island. Through 12 chapters, we explore how music shapes life and life shapes music in Taiwan. In this volume, we ask not only what music can tell us about Taiwan, but how music tells us. The contributors to this volume range in their career trajectories from a PhD candidate through to a distinguished professor, with every stage in between represented. Nine of the contributing authors are ethnomusicologists by training, two are anthropologists, and one hails from communications. A fairly broad approach to our sounding subjects is displayed. Some chapters are rooted in the methods and concerns explored by Taiwan's first generation of ethnomusicologists, particularly Xu Changhui and his disciples. Other chapters employ social theories developed in North America and Europe. Eight authors grew up in Taiwan, but all pursued their doctoral degrees in the United States or the United Kingdom. When I invited these scholars to contribute to this volume, I did not ask them to write on specific topics. Rather, I waited to see what subjects were foremost in their own research interests. The book is by no means a comprehensive representation of musical life in Taiwan nor is it representative of any particular theoretical approach. It is a sampling of those issues and subjects of current interest to scholars who are dedicated to understanding the role that music plays in Taiwan. It is the only such volume in a European language. The chapters do not fall easily into sections or categories since numerous themes cross several chapters and most chapters touch on multiple issues. Their ordering does not mean to suggest a particular development or trajectory. In this introduction, I call attention to common topics in what may appear to be random order as I zigzag from chapter to chapter. As for the historic scope, um, our work begins in chapter one with Wang Yingfen's exploration of musical life as documented during the Japanese colonial period. Most of, their of the chapters trace their subjects through several decades of history. 
though several focus very much on the contemporary moment and music's role in negotiation uh, or in negotiating positionality. The subjects of our inquiries range from traditional music that enjoys several hundred years of history in Taiwan to recent creations. In chapter one, Wang takes four examples from her research on historical recordings in colonial Taiwan to reflect on her research methodology. She argues for an integrative and dialogic approach to study music as processes, given that since most Taiwanese musicians before 1945 rarely left writings or notated compositions, historical recordings often become the only means through which we can understand their musical thoughts and practices. Therefore, it is all the more important that we know how to listen and how to study these historical recordings in order to re-sound colonial Taiwan. Chapters two and three focus on musics of indigenous music, musicians. The placement of these essays early in the book is no way a signal that book chapters are progressing from traditional subjects through to new ones. In fact, these chapters both deal with contemporary and innovative artistic creations. In focusing on Ami's popular music, DJ Hatfield finds contemporary singers exploring notions of alliance in their creative work. Alliances between themselves and Taiwan's settler population and between themselves and other Austronesian peoples across the Pacific and Indian Oceans. In these ways, attention is shifted away from questions of identity and towards music's ability to imagine and activate relationships. The chapter concludes that the work of indigenous musicians who center their efforts on the production of alliances reveals new directions for expanding Taiwan's democratic reforms. This direction is not visible in sociological surveys or opinion polls, but can be heard in musical expressions as, artist, as artists negotiate alliances among each other and with the wider world. Through listening, we may learn of ways to think beyond identity politics, which has dominated discussions of Taiwanese culture and politics for decades. In chapter three, Chen Chun Bin takes On the Road, a musical theater production sponsored by and staged in Taiwan's National Concert Hall as a vehicle for investigating musical modernity among Taiwanese or Taiwan's indigenous people. By examining the musical's compositional process, this chapter illustrates how sociocultural interactions between Aborigines and settlers shape contemporary indigenous music, and it documents some of the ways in which Puyuma people create, convey, and perceive meaning through musicking. Of the traditional musics included in the volume, None enjoy greater attention than Beiguan, a musical and theatrical genre brought to Taiwan by immigrants from Fujian province in the 1700s. Beiguan continues to play an essential role in ritual settings in both Hoklo and Hakka communities across Taiwan. In fact, if you've ever heard one of the not uncommon ritual processions through Taipei streets or elsewhere across the island, performed by shams, drums, and gongs, then you've probably heard Beiguan music. Uh, Li Jinghui's chapter seven provides an introduction to the social context and musical elements that constitute Beiguan. This preface is necessar necessary to her detailed discussion of the oral construction of gender, which is central to the genre, especially when it is performed for temple gods by all male troops in ritual settings. And in chapter eight, Chen Mei Jin focuses on Taiwan's policies for the preservation of its intangible cultural heritage. She takes as her main case study, Kai Lu Gu, which is a traditional music genre that employs Beiguan melodies and is used in religious processions and pilgrimages. Temple festival and ritual uh, procession music which are provided by Beiguan, 
are central to chapter nine and Jennifer Shea's study of noise and the ways in which it is broadly conceived, either as an unwelcome sonic presence, zao ying, or as a beloved component of a bustling social and ritual life, ri nao. As she discuss, will discuss in a few minutes, Shea analyzes how, song, how noise is regulated by governmental authorities. All three of these chapters provide markedly different angles for viewing this traditional music, which is still very much a vital part of life in Taiwan. And continuing on the theme of religious practice is Xu Xingwen's examination in chapter six of how hymns have been composed to serve as tools to help Hakka Christians negotiate conflicts that arise between secular ethics in Taiwan and Hakka sacred practices. The messages encoded in hymn texts, as well as the practice of group singing, serve to build community among this minority religious group. <clears throat> as hymn production and dissemination crosses national boundaries, Hakka hymns also serve to link Hakka Christians in Taiwan with those in other Sinophone regions. <clears throat> As Da Sao or uh, Lu discusses in chapter five, music has served as a vital force in the creation of a positive identity for, Yuna, uh, for a Yunnanese community in Longan Taoyuan County. The founding members of this community came to Taiwan from the Tai Miramar frontier, where as part of the nationalist military, they staged unsuccessful incursions into Taiwan at the end of the Chinese Civil War. Now living in Northern Taiwan, this lost army is joined by immigrants from Southeast Asia who have, re do you hear my rabbit chewing a box back here? Yeah, that's the sound, if you wanna know what's going on. So this group of people are um, now living, um, or have been joined by immigrants from Southeast Asia who have recently created new music and dance practices as part of their development of a vibrant commercial zone known as the Enchanted Golden Triangle. Their performances are central features of one day tours and multiple festivals that draw tourists from around Taiwan who come to experience exotic music, dance, and cuisine. And importantly, prior to Lu's work published in this volume, the music and performance activities of Taiwan's Southeast Asian immigrant communities had almost entirely escaped scholarly notice. In her chapter on the Taipei Chinese Orchestra, uh, Ming Yan Li looks at how music from another time and place took root and thrived under the conditions of Taiwan's cultural and political environments. The modern Chinese orchestra traces its origins to the 1920s in China, formed in the red hot cauldron of the May 4th movement with its urgent push for modernization. The orchestra's structure is based on that of the symphony orchestra. In creating this national music, innovators adapted traditional Chinese instruments to make possible a large range of pitches and harmonic structures that had previously been foreign to native Chinese music. Through her examination of the Taipei Chinese Orchestra, Li traces how the ensemble's music has reflected and promoted shifting notions of Taiwan's cultural and um, political identities, often as those were articulated by holders of the nation's highest political offices. Over the decades, Chinese music in Taiwan or Chinese orchestral music in Taiwan transformed from stoking nostalgia for the lost Chinese homeland to articulating unique, uniquely Taiwanese expressions by drawing on elements from the local musical heritage. Listening across the history of the Taipei Chinese Orchestra allows for an oral journey through shifting understandings of Taiwan's cultural and political identities. And Meredith Schweig will, in a few minutes, or at the end of our um, presentation, discuss her chapter on Teresa Dung. 
And finally, in chapter 11, Chen um, Lin Chen Yu uh, examines the efforts of indie musicians as they navigate an increasingly fragmented music market. The, the challenges they face are many, including the potential banning of their works by PRC censors in what is potentially their largest market. It's not uncommon for indie groups to apply for support from various state-sponsored agencies in Taiwan. Chen looks at these challenges uh, these musicians face as they aim to maintain some degree of creative independence while navigating these complex and sometimes treacherous waters. Um, and just briefly, uh, with these two chapters, we move to the realm of sound studies. Um, Jennifer Shea takes the concept again of Renau and we'll discuss her work in just a minute. And I will be discussing my chapter on garbage truck music after her. So altogether, the contributors to this volume invite listeners to become listeners. Oh, I got that wrong. We invite readers to become listeners. And we hope that resounding Taiwan will serve as a guide to the island's sounds and musics and to their study. And we hope that the volume will inspire our colleagues and other disciplines to listen and to hear what the music that surrounds them in Taiwan has to say. So thank you for that. And I'm going to get my rabbit to a different room before I have my own presentation. So thanks a lot. And next we'll have Jennifer. As soon as I stop sharing my screen. Hi, can you, can you hear me okay? okay? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay, okay. thank you. Um, I will let my... Okay, is this visible? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, well, I'll, I'll briefly go over kind of the things that I, I talk about in my chapter, um, but a brief background on my larger research project uh, from which this paper originates. So for 16 months from 2014 to 2015, I conducted ethnographic fieldwork about urban noise in Taipei to examine the challenges and techniques of communicating oral experience. I spent time at the Noise Control Office in the Taiwan Environmental Protection Administration where I learned about the day-to-day -day operations of managing noise. This included going to policy meetings, reading reports on noise, taking part in office conversations, and going on site visits for noise inspections. And example of the typical type of noise that you'll find in Taipei, here's a number of air conditioners and other kinds of machinery that are in the alleyways. And so thinking about how sound travels within the dense um, corridors in Taipei was part of um, what I was looking at when I was working with the Noise Control Office. So what appeared at first to be a straightforward project about the day-to-day -day operations of managing sound became much more complicated. Um, the reason for this is that the office was not only a place for reporting industrial noise, it was also the central hub that collected, documented, and arbitrated a variety of residential noise. This included the sounds of traffic and factory noise, as well as more surprising sounds, including piano playing in apartment buildings, uh, the chopping of meat on street vending carts, the dripping of water from air conditioning units, and the croaking of wild frogs in a pond nearby households. And so, in other words, the noise control office became this place where residents in the state negotiated the infinite possibilities of sounds as noise. The assumption being that sound was not intrinsically a noise problem, but that all sounds had the possibility of becoming noise through the bureaucratic system around the noise complaint system. I've written about these specific issues in articles and book chapters in the areas of sound studies, anthropology, and history of science. Um, but this is the first time I'm really engaging in a musical context. And uh, it's an area that is very near, near and dear to my heart. And um, what I what I talk about mainly in my chapter is about the Daja Matsu pilgrimage. And in this chapter, I focus specifically on the relationship between festival sounds and Renau, as Renau and environmental noise as Zhao Yin. My chapter begins with a vignette uh, with Gary, the head of an environmental inspection team in Northern Taiwan, 
who explained to me that the problem with noise is that it is very hard to manage. He was saying in a somewhat indirect yet culturally loaded manner that um, in general, it's just not a good idea to tell people that they cannot observe their holidays. So complicating matters further, Gary was telling me that, uh, was suggesting, excuse me, th the need for caution when interfering with otherworldly affairs. In contrast to official attitudes during the authoritarian era that regarded temple festivals as noisy and uncivilized, government authorities today believe that the idea of disrupting a temple festival would be seen as a hostile act towards a community. Other inspectors that I spoke to held similar views, explaining that any attempt to enforce noise regulations during religious festivals would just generate public outcry. Their reluctance to manage festival sounds is supported by official policies under the Noise Control Act of 1983, established by the Ministry of Health and currently now is the um, Environmental Protection Administration that grants traditional festivals an exemption from noise control regulations. Still at the same time, this has not stopped some unhappy neighbors to file noise complaints and noise control managers always anticipate an increase of complaints around uh, festival noise whenever large uh, festivals happen, such as the Daja Mazu pilgrimage. And I think I took this photo probably around two in the morning. Um, and of course, as you can see, it's a very lively setting, um, very enjoyable setting, um, I might add. But um, through noise complaints about te temple festivals, residents are negotiating the cultural value of temple festivals, the quality of life questions around getting a good night's sleep, and the physical impact of the sounds themselves. So unique to Taiwan's noise control system is the ongoing question of whether the sounds of traditional festivals, including fireworks, drumming, and amplify loudspeakers, cross the threshold from the cultural aesthetic of Vernal into the regulated domain of Zaoyin. There are two different ways that people might respond to this complaint. For the first response, I will defer to the Taiwanese rapper, Duaki, um, and this is a credit to Nancy for bringing my attention to this song in the first place. Uh, but as he explains in this song on Temple called Temple Fair, uh, living with festival no noise is a matter of Taiwanese identity. And to, in order to understand and respect the sound, you have to uh, understand the culture. So here you have the image of his, his uh, special guest who's in pajamas. He has a, a eye mask over his forehead and he's trying to get a good night's sleep, but he can't. And and finally, you know, these group, this group of people around him are, are educating him about the importance of temple festivals in Taiwan. And so in, in this case, you know, the argument is that if you understand the purpose of a temple festival and what it means to a community, then you wouldn't find it noisy and you wouldn't complain. For me, um, I take a slightly different approach and um, I actually depart from questions about whether the sounds of Renau are acceptable or not. And instead, I examine what it means for the concept of Renau to exist in tension with the concept of Zao Ying. So I ask, how does Renau complicate assumptions around noise and noise control? How does the emergence of noise regulations in Taiwan reconfigure the public's relationship to the state, particularly around changing perceptions of Renau? In the sections of my book, I, uh, of my chapter, excuse me, I analyze studies of Renal with respect to the literature on traditional temple festivals and their relationship to the state. I examine the historical transformation through which Renal has been criticized, moralized, and protected as a cultural value, starting from the Japanese colonial period and moving to the KMT era. Drawing on interviews with government officials, Taipei city residents, as well as my own participant observation during one leg of the Dajamazu pilgrimage, and this is, um, an annual eight-day, 300-kilometer pilgrimage in central Taiwan to honor the goddess Matsu, the patron saint of Taiwan. I discuss the different ways in which the discourse of Renal is entangled with the discussions of Zhao Yin. Through an ethnographic and historical analysis, this chapter expands an understanding of Renal from a cultural, local aesthetic into an articulation of political commitments, one that continues to be negotiated today in the sonic domain. Rather than fixed, discrete objects, Renal and Zalin, I argue, operate in relation to one another as fluid concepts that are being reworked and reassessed through the auditory sensibilities of, Taiwanese public, of the Taiwanese public. What I show in my chapter is that temple festivals are more than a cultural and religious tradition. They hold political significance, one that continues to evolve from the past to the present. 
during the Japanese colonial era and then again with the KMT, temples signified threats to state power, first as an expression of Han Chinese identity and later as an obstacle to social progress. Anthropologists starting from the 1970s and 1980s have in addition written about temple festivals as a site of resistance and local identity. In these instances, Renault represents a sound making practice that subverts state power through its multifaceted ability to produce order and harmony. This happens in the creation of crowds, while also disrupting established norms in the production of carnival carnivalesque spectacle. From the perspective of music, however, we can understand from political philosopher Jacques Attali, who writes that the ritual power of music becomes folded into state power. And this is where the distinction between Renault and Zhaoyin becomes complicated. Starting with uh, Zhang Jingguo's visit to Beigang Cha Tiangong in the late 1960s, temple festivals have also been used as a form of legitimizing state power. My chapter goes into further details of the deliberations by legislators during the 1980s when they were deciding on whether or not Rana fit into the scope of noise regulation. I also write about the different ways that the idea of noise as unwanted sound continues to be complicated by the cultural ideals of Bernal in a way that exceeds Western conceptualizations of noise. In other words, the concept of noise in the English language is insufficient to capture the many different ideas and meanings around noise and noisiness in the Taiwanese context. Thinking beyond the binaries of Renal and Lenjing, coldness, the profane and the sacred, the ruled and the ruler, I examine how these two parallel ideal ideologies of noise, Renal and Zaoyin, relate to one another within the enactment of everyday life. How do questions of civility, cultural identity, and quality of life emerge within discourses of noise? An analysis of the, of the sociocultural features of temple festivals and of how individuals argue for either the inclusion or exclusion of temple festivals within Taiwan's noise control system offers new ways to rethink the role of temple festivals in producing identification and community with others. By thinking about these two concepts alongside one another, I show how the phenomenon of traditional temple festivals is not a relic of the past, but a social practice that is continuously evolving and in dialogue with existing social institutions. Uh, to conclude, my chapter examines how the sounding practices, and let me go back to my slide share here. Oh, images of Dajah Mahatma pilgrimage. So to conclude, my chapter examines how the sounding practices at traditional temple festivals simultaneously are qualities of Renault that become re-signified through, through the concept of Zhao Yin. The persistent tension between these two concepts enables them to be understood as categories that are co-constructed rather than naturalized. In this way, it would be a mistake to assume that Renal is an endemically Taiwanese concept while Zhao Yin is a Western one, nor is it the case that Renal is more traditional while Zhao Yin is more modern. Instead, these two concepts circulate in relation to one another in ways that have defined and developed the concepts well into the 21st century. And as a final conclusion, I want to just add that Renal and Zhao Yin exist these distinctions exist in the secular domain as well. And this uh, one example of this is actually from, um, goes back to music, which is the performance of an Ame song called Three Days, Three Nights. And um, this song actually perpetuated uh, the creation of a specific noise control article. It's called the Ame Tiawen, which prohibits the performance of this one particular song at Taipei Arena. Um, and the reason is because this song causes people to jump around in the stadium and they're jumping on the metal seating areas, which causes vibration, which then actually was traveling underground and being felt in residential apartment house, apartments um, a kilometer away. So this one Ame song had the capability to make a lot of noise that um, eventually reached the attention of the noise control officials. And this is just, again, another really interesting way to think about how sounding practices and the very various acts of hearing different sounds as noise are negotiated continuously with one or another um, and also offers us a way to think about the embodied and conceptual boundaries of political participation and if i have time i will just show just the one clip with the chorus of the ame song to give you a sense of um this run now in in a secular setting yeah. And I, I have it queued up, so 
it should it should work. Oh wait. I need to turn on my sound. Include computer sound. Okay. Okay, so so you get the you get the idea. Um, but thank you so much for listening, and I will pass it on to um, our next speaker. So that would be me, and I'm going to begin by playing a familiar sound. Anyone who lives in Taiwan or has visited for any period of time would be very familiar with this song, that Maiden's Prayer. Um, it, along with Beethoven's Fur Elise, are the most common uh, songs that we hear in the collection of garbage and almost everywhere in Taiwan. And just a fun fact, um, the, the Fur Elise Beethoven piece is a much more recent addition the Maiden's Prayer came in 1968 with the first musical garbage trucks when they were imported from Japan. Um, so with my talk today, my little introduction today, I'm going to talk more about the process of um, studying musical garbage trucks, how I came to do this, partly because people always look at me strangely and wonder why I'm studying the music of garbage trucks and how would I ever come to this kind of subject. So I'm going to walk you through that process. Um, for the In the actual chapter, I spend a lot of time talking about the history, tracing the history of these trucks and their music over the last half century. And I pay particular attention to how the music of the trucks was interwoven continu uh, with continually evolving schemes for garbage collection. And so please, if you're interested in these details, I invite you to read the chapter. Um, so back in the late 1990s and early 2000s, when I was familiarizing myself with the vast body of Taiwanese popular music, I started to notice what seemed to me to be a lot of songs that referenced specific places and elements of the natural world. Of all of these, the Dan Shui River which flows about 13 kilometers from Taipei to the northern port city of Danshui, seemed to have received special attention. As I began collecting songs referencing the Danshui, I found that songs from the first half of the 20th century portrayed idyllic, idyllic scenes of the river and its surroundings. However, as Taiwan's economic miracle took shape, the Danshui River became severely polluted. Beginning in the early 1980s, the river's profound degradation became the subject of numerous songs and even then, even films um, and theatrical pieces, or at least uh, sub themes in um, films and theatrical pieces. And some of the pieces that dealt with the river's pollution also mentioned garbage. Noting this, I created a file in which I tucked away songs that referenced garbage. I felt that the mention of trash in popular music was certainly something special, if not unique to Taiwan. I revisited my garbage file when I was asked to give a talk at a Hearing Landscapes Critically conference in 2014. I then began to collect Taiwan's garbage songs in earnest. 
Currently, with the help of my ABLE research assistant, I've gathered over 100 songs that in some way reference garbage. And in fact, we stopped collecting some because garbage also ends up being um, something about love affairs. I uh, talk about that another day. Um, some of the songs I've collected incorporate familiar garbage truck melodies. So it's not just a textual reference, but they also um, use the melodies heard in the garbage collection routine. Others reference chasing the garbage truck, and some even compare themselves or their lovers to garbage trucks. I also began to notice the prevalence of waste-related themes in other Taiwanese cultural products, including films and television shows. Uh, for example, I wonder if any of you honed in on the garbage sub-theme in the 2017 award-winning film, The Great Buddha Plus, the Dafua Pu La Se, Garbage is uh, constantly appearing in that film. I published an essay in 2019 in which I sorted out all of this garbage as it had been sounded in Taiwan's popular songs. And um, for anyone who has never visited Taiwan, you need to know that musical garbage trucks can be heard and seen in nearly every residential area in Taiwan most days of the week. In densely populated areas, they may cross through different portions of a district multiple times in a single evening. There's probably no more pervasive music in Taiwan than the regular broadcast of the trucks as they wind their ways through urban and rural streets, calling residents to meet them where they will dump their household waste, their sordid household waste. The essay in the resounding volume represents the next step in my investigation of the representation of garbage in music and related arts in Taiwan. This and my previous work are part of an ongoing large scale project. With my chapter, which was the next step in this process, I felt that the most important thing I needed to do was to clarify the history of Taiwan's musical garbage trucks and to trace how the truck's music had been intertwined over the last half century with evolving policies and practices related to the collection of household waste and to concepts of garbage generally. I was keen to keep an eye on the sentiments surrounding trash and its collection because it is here where we begin to see how some individuals imagine their daily habits and practices connecting to larger societal and environmental issues. In theorizing that the near constant presence of garbage truck melodies has contributed to a strong awareness of environmental degradation, I turned primarily to Rob Nixon's concept of slow violence. For Nixon, slow violence unfolds gradually and largely out of sight. Slow Violence is neither spectacular nor instantaneous, but rather incremental and accumulative. It's calamitous repercussions playing out across a range of temporal scales. Climate change, the radioactive aftermath of wars, and deforestation are a few of Nixon's examples of slow violence. To these, I add contamination of water sources and the omnipresence of environmental microplastics. One of the greatest challenges in combating slow violence is gaining and keeping attention focused on the unfolding calamity. The long emergencies of slow violence are not immediately spectacular. You're not gonna see it on CNN or any other news broadcast. Those are fantastic fast violences that you see there. But slow violence is something that's ha happening around you all the time in the background, and you may not even be cognizant of it. Um, and just to say that while climate change, he noted as a slow violence is now actually becoming not a slow violence. It is becoming spectacular with recent flooding and fires. The long emergency of climate change is becoming spectacular. So taking the United Daily News database as one of my primary sources, I documented sec um, sentiments related to garbage truck music, waste collection, and most importantly, the conceptual tying together of household waste with larger environmental concerns. 
As early as February 1970, a newspaper column voiced concerns over the placement of a landfill in proximity to the Xingdian River, which is near the source for Taipei's water supply. The column touted garbage trucks broadcasting the Maiden's Prayer as a sign of a functioning, functioning municipality in a modern state. It warned, however, quote, once the water is polluted, everyone's health in Taipei will be affected, end quote. This example provides early evidence of a conceptual linkage between garbage, its daily musical collection, and the slow violence of water supply contamination. The 1990s saw increasing expression of these types of concerns. For example, a piece published in May 1993 by essayist Chen Huang humorously quips, quote, everyone jams their garbage into their homes, listening intently on all sides. Our ting ba fang. They sit, straining to hear the sound of the truck's music because the garbage truck doesn't wait for anyone or for garbage. End quote. He colorfully depicts the travails involved in the daily challenge of meeting the garbage truck before it passes. His essay closes with a tone of resignation, end or quote, as every city considers how to manage the huge headache of garbage, whose mass swells day by day. Average citizens also have their energy depleted in their efforts to dump their garbage. Garbage. It's the greatest enemy of 20th century humans. Humanity's ability to produce garbage far outstrips its ability to eliminate it. Its scope ranges from nuclear waste to cigarette butts. It is truly multifarious. You can't help but sigh in awe." End quote. Chen's linkage of everyday household trash to nuclear waste and all manner of ref refuse in between demonstrates that for some Taiwanese, the everyday anxiety-laden practice of listening for the maiden's prayer and chasing the garbage truck calls to mind environmental crises of far later, greater scope. One of the keys to Taiwan's success in its significant reduction of household waste is that the garbage collection routine with its familiar and almost omnipresent garbage truck music never allows the issue of waste to recede too far from people's minds. This chapter argues that the everyday engagement with waste collection, particularly orally through garbage truck music, has heightened awareness of larger issues of environmental degradation and is in part responsible for Taiwan's laudable success in not only reducing household waste, but also creating the conditions that have earned Taiwan the designation an island of green in Asia. So with that, I pass it on to Meredith. Great, thank you so much, Nancy. All right, can everyone hear me? Fantastic. Yeah. I'm going to share my screen. Great. Okay, so <clears throat> can everyone see that as well? Nancy, I can only see you, but if you can see my uh, PowerPoint, can you give me a thumbs up? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. When Teresa Tang died in 1995 as the result of a severe asthma attack, her vast community of fans worldwide seemed likewise suddenly breathless, rendered temporarily silent and immobile by their collective grief. Born in Taiwan to a KMT military family, Tang rose to stardom, mega stardom throughout East and Southeast Asia as a gifted singer of folk tunes and romantic ballads. A quarter century after her passing at the young age of 42, she remains beloved by legions of listeners who have anointed her the eternal heavenly empress of popular song. Tang's continued presence in popular culture is ensured by her ongoing reincarnation in an array of media, much of which eulogizes her as an icon of pan Chineseness. This legacy has assumed a mammoth life of its own, shifting between background and foreground through decades of popular film, literature, and journalism, 
that frame her accomplishments in life in terms of the sense of shared loss inflicted by her untimely death. Um, and I, I'm sure that anyone who's made made time in their Friday night to to participate in this conversation with us probably has uh, some awareness of of the Li Jun and her and her legacy in Taiwan. But if you haven't been, this is an image of her uh, memorial um, in Jinshan on the northeast coast of Taiwan. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead. There's there's a little bit of um, sound here. This is a video that I took just in in this. Uh, I think it was this past March when I was in Taiwan. So you'll hear um, a kind of a, a loudspeaker system that plays her music uh, from dawn to dusk while the Memorial Park is open. In the years after Teng's passing, much of the scholarship addressing the singer's impact emphasizes the politics of her reception by PRC-based and global Sinophone listeners, reflecting, for example, on the ways in which Teng's, quote, soft, soothing voice literally reformed the sonic culture of socialist China, end quote, David Wong describes her as having, quote, adopted a traditional Chinese lyric style, a style she accentuated by featuring songs inspired by classical Chinese poetry and song lyrics, end quote. Esther Chung characterizes Tang as a presence who had a, quote, powerful unifying impact on the worldwide transnational Chinese communities, end quote. Likewise, Sheldon H. Liu refers to Tang's songs as both deterritorialized and pan-Chinese. While such assessments provide important insights into the formative processes of transnational citizenship and diasporic identity that are often articulated by and through popular music, they remember Tang selectively. They rarely transcend facile descriptions of the singer's voice and elide the specificities of the historical moments audible in many of her musical performances, shaped as they were within the constraints of her celebrity as a Taiwan-born Waishengren under KMT hegemony at the apex of the Cold War. My chapter in Resounding Taiwan stages a musicological intervention into this historiography, listening closely to Tang for insight into the ways in which the singer articulated and negotiated these constraints musically. In this endeavor, I draw on ethnomusicologist Catherine Meisel's notion of multivocality, defined in its most essential form as the practice of singing with many voices. In Meisel's theorization, singing voices can be, quote, sites of struggle and becoming, negotiating material and sonic borders between musical genres, between ideologies, between cultures, end quote. Those who perform across such borders but, uh, habitually are not only performing in multiple vocalities, but more critically, they are performing multivocality, that is, negotiating their narratable selves by singing with many voices. Teng was indeed a multilingual musical omnivore who shapeshifted her way to spectacular success in multiple music markets, performing in diverse styles that appealed to listeners across and beyond the Sinophone world. I argue that a fuller understanding of Teng's social, cultural, and political significance demands close engagement with the materiality of her famous instrument and the musicianship she exercised in using it. By turning down the volume on Tang's posthumous legacy, we might hear in her performance of multivocality tensions arising from her status as a Waishengren between claims to Chinese subjectivity on one hand and attachments to Taiwanese life on the other. We might also come to appreciate her corpus of recordings as documenting the disciplines she developed to walk the tightrope of these and other tensions. I do not dispute that Tang's memory has coalesced around powerful homogenizing narratives of pan chinese which have proven time and again commercially expedient, as well as vulnerable to co-optation for political purposes. I work instead to carve out an adjacent space in which to ponder the singer's multivocality as an instrument of agency and site for the negotiation of difference. In her work on vocal timbre and racial subjectivity, Nina Eidsheim explores the voice as socially produced rather than, than innate. Vocal choices, she argues, are, quote, based on the vocalizer's position within the collective rather than arising solely as individual expression, end quote. Keeping Eidsheim in mind, the first section of my chapter, Historicizing Voices, asks, <clears throat> which collectives can we hear in or through Tang's voice? By considering formative events as they overlapped with and impinged on the development of her musicianship, 
her knowledge of both repertoire and techniques, can we trace the decisions the singer made to render her available world in sound? In response to these questions, I sketch the arc of Tang's musical upbringing in Taiwan and then abroad, starting with her childhood in military dependence villages and tracing her early performances in Taipei nightclubs as a teenager. Through this time, she engaged with Peking opera, Huangmei opera, and Shanghainese popular songs, which were essential components of the cosmopolitan sound world she inhabited. I attend to the formative impact of Japanese and Japanese-derived popular music on those sound worlds in the form of Hlelo adaptations of Japanese tunes, as well as the Nakashi music performed by itinerant street musicians and in the entertainment venues of Beitou, not far from the Tang family residence on Phoenix Mountain. Tang herself would attest later in life to her early memories of the Japanese ballad form Enka, telling one interviewer, quote, I grew up in Taiwan listening to Japanese songs, so I cannot think of Japanese songs as being foreign music." End quote. In each of these settings, Tang was, of course, not just encountering music, but in voicing it. In local song competitions and on nightclub stages, she invoked her knowledge of Huangmei opera, performing as a Xiaosheng, a young male character who is often a romantic lead. Even as she strained at times to plumb the lower registers of her naturally high-pitched voice, she sang powerfully, projecting outward with rhythmic precision and clear diction, befitting the conventions of that style. Before becoming a headliner, headliner Tang opened for more established artists whose vocal techniques and repertoire choices were at that time more stylistically heterogeneous than her own, including Yao Surong and Mei Dai. Yao expertly melded techniques and aesthetics associated with Shanghainese popular songs, Enka, Heloa popular songs, and American blue-eyed soul. Each of these, in turn, of course, already themselves explicitly hybrid genres. Riffing on the previous decade's practice of adapting Japanese tunes and translating them into holo for the local market, one of Yao's biggest hits, Heartless Person, was a Japanese composition set with Mandarin lyrics. Likewise, Mei Dai's Unforgettable Memory. Although Tang never commented on it publicly, Yao's career must have both inspired and chastened her. The KMT held a monopoly over broadcast media from the end of the 1940s until the early 1990s, maintained a complex censorship apparatus and, and, apparatus, excuse me, and required musicians to apply for licenses for legal public performance. Seven years Tang Sr., Yao was repeatedly stymied by authorities who characterized her music as licentious and doleful, and therefore morally corrosive. In the next chapter, in the next part of my chapter, Negotiating Constraint, I discuss Tang's efforts to avoid Yao's fate. Tang's military family pedigree, crystalline Mandarin, and youthful persona positioned her to thrive in Taiwan's popular music market, under the shadow of the Chinese Cultural Renaissance Movement. As her star rose, however, and she began to travel more frequently, it became incumbent on her to navigate the KMT's Cold War interests abroad. She performed with small traveling ensembles for expatriate communities throughout Southeast Asia and provided televised concerts for conscripts. Famously, her voice performed part of the Sonic Arsenal broadcast from Jinmen beginning in 1974 careful negotiation of the KMT's demands, and I do get into episodes of conflict in the full chapter, enabled her widespread travel and international career development. In Japan, Tang was not just viable, but wildly successful as an Enka singer, winning numerous industry accolades and developing a broad and faithful Japanese fan base. This was an intuitive move for her. The vocals for many of her hello songs from the early uh, 1970s either have a subtle Nakashi flavor or were themselves local language performances of Enka. Japan provided Tang with space to engage her interests in Japanese music outside of Taiwan, where the dominant political power stigmatized expressions of affinity with the island's former colonizer. In interviews with the Japanese press, Tang described her ongoing aspirations to perfecting her command of Enka techniques. Such aspirations are, per Mizell, integral to the project of cultivating multivocality, which requires not just knowledge of repertoire, but also knowledge of techniques that maintain the integrity of other styles. By her own account, Tang approached Japan not just as a new market, 
but also as an opportunity to augment her multi vocality. In the final section of my chapter, Sounding Agency Through Multi vocality, I perform a close reading of Tang's performance of her iconic 1979 cover of the Shanghainese popular song, When Will You Come Back Again? Hurry Jin Zai Lai. Assessments of Tang as performing reified Chineseness seem to rest precisely on recordings such as this, which such as such as this, which because of its provenance dovetails neatly with listener knowledge of both Tang's Waisheng heritage and her public support for KMT sinicization initiatives. In the scholarly literature on these recordings, however, there are telling hints of interpretive uncertainty. Cheng Chenqing, who has written widely on Tang, provides evidence for widespread acceptance of the, quote, nature of Chineseness of Teresa Tang, end quote, quoting lyricist Wang Jim regarding her singing voice and its, quote, indescribable Chinese flavor, end quote. For his own part, however, Cheng muses on why he, he himself finds it difficult to, to identify, quote, specific evidence of any Chinese flavor in her voice, end quote, or why she was described as such in contradistinction to other contemporary singers. Acknowledging Tang's multivocality and her agency in wielding it widens the space for interpretation. With this in mind, I reframe When Will You Come Back Again as a deft exploration of sonic borderscape. First performed in 1937 by Zhou Shen, the song was emblematic of what would later be characterized as decadent music in both the PRC and the ROC, evoking memories of life in China before the end of the Second Sino-Japanese War. Listening to Zhou's recording of the song, however, lays bare the gulf between her interpretation and Tang's. Unfortunately, <clears throat> I don't have time in this short presentation to work through my analysis in detail. Um, here's a, this is a, a clip of a, a, of a transcription kind of comparing a, a short passage. There are two different performances of that passage. Let it suffice to say, however, that Tang's performance diverges from Joe's in several key ways. Most obviously, Tang transposes the song down a minor third from B flat major to G major and pushes the lower end of her range. Although she begins most phrases in time, she slows the tempo significantly, creating space to bend the ends of phrases rhythmically with decorative flourishes that skirt the downbeat. Tang's divergences can be described using vocabulary that anthropologist Christine Yano employs in her pathbreaking scholarship on Inca. Where Shanghainese popular singers of the 1930s and 40s often delivered smooth, restrained, and one might say frictionless performances, Enka has long prized excess and drama. Indeed, seasoned Enka performers are esteemed for their ability to evoke emotional turmoil through the deployment of recognized performance techniques known as kata. Tang invokes several kata, in When Will You Come Back Again, her deeper register suggests jigoe, or the, the chest voice, one of the three voices described in Japanese vocal theory. Um, she emphasizes rather than conceals the contrast between her high and low voice as a demonstration of both skill and emotive range. Moreover, when she ends phrases on low notes, she consistently employs yuri, a broad vocal swinging that Yano distinguishes from the European concept of vibrato because of its slow, rhythmic, and temporally variable quality. My analysis further explores Tang's use of end phrase ornamentation, termed kobushi, and her invocation of serifu, the spoken passages found frequently in Enka, which detour from the sung performance for a moment of direct and theatrical connection with the listener. And if we have time in the Q&A period, I'm happy to play this, the, these clips so that those who are unfamiliar with these recordings might hear what I'm referring to. It is by now cliche to remark on the irreducibility of Taiwaneseness, as discourses of multiculturalism, diversity, and hybridity have been at the center of public life and politics in Taiwan since the end of martial law. As demonstrated throughout resounding Taiwan, musicologists and sound study scholars have enthusiastically embraced this plural turn, and studies that explore emphatically syncretic traditions and forms from Taiwanese opera to holo pop songs to mando pop have proliferated. And yet, Teresa Tang is still often positioned, especially in non-musical musicological scholarship, as both pan-Chinese and sui generis, in spite of the fact that her work likewise reflects and refracts in particular ways 
the cultural and linguistic heterogeneity of the place in which she grew up. I show that it is possible and reasonable to employ analytical vocabulary from Enka to describe Tang's vocal choices in When Will You Come Back Again? Through this exercise, I hope that we might come to appreciate Tang's exploration of sonic borderscape between genres, between ideologies, between cultures. His oral study of Tang's life and times is certainly illuminating, but it can only tell us so much. Listening to Tang herself may be our only recourse to accessing her, her agency. And in order to delineate fully the complexity of the singer's narratable selves, we must attend to her multivocality. Of course, multiculturalism and multivocality are not interchangeable concepts, and multivocal performance is not the ineluctable tendency of all musicians from multicultural Taiwan. As I show in my chapter, Tang did not come by her multivocality uh, passively as a consequence of her Taiwanese-ness. She cultivated it meticulously over the course of many years. I draw attention to this distinction in order to highlight what I believe are two key messages of my chapter for Taiwan Studies scholars. Firstly, music and sound can provide powerful insight into the ontological and epistemological foundations of identity construction. Artists, including but certainly not limited to Tang, have often operated on the front lines of politics in Taiwan and been compelled to strategize deliberately their performances of race, ethnicity, gender, and social class. And secondly, artists may exercise their musical agency in ways that disrupt or complicate facile interpretations of those performances. With this in mind, let us listen closely to the many and varied voices that resonate from Taiwan in recognition of their full complexity. Thank you so much. Excuse me. All right, is my show ended? Great.